me great pleasure to welcome you to uh, tonight's lecture, which is to honor uh, the 80th birthday of my distinguished colleague, Professor Tom Kibble, who is sitting down in the front row. Earlier in the day, we had a symposium of uh, three talks by leading international scientists who profiled Tom's profound contributions to our understanding of the physical world. In particular, we heard about Tom's groundbreaking papers of 1964 and 1967, which seemed to be intimately connected with the discovery of the new boson at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN last year. I'm sure we'll hear much more about this marvelous arc of scientific discovery, which is based over nearly five decades in tonight's lecture by Professor Steven Weinberg. Steven Weinberg is one of the great, the true greats of modern theoretical physics. And he's had a, a, distinct, a very distinguished, a truly distinguished career. He currently holds the Jack Josie S. Uh, Welsh Foundation Chair at the University of Texas, Austin. And he's received countless awards and honors, most notably the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1979, which he shared with Sheldon Glashow, his high school classmate, and Abdus Salam of Imperial College. He's also a great communicator of the subject and has written influential books both for students of physics as well as to broader audiences. And on a personal note, I read his famous book, The First Three Minutes, at a very formative period of my own scientific career when I was at high school in Australia and was struck by the beautiful exposition of uh, the description of the origins of the universe. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Stephen Weinberg to deliver tonight's lecture titled Tom Kibble, Breaking Symmetries, Breaking Ground, and the New Boson. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm, I'm very pleased to have this chance uh, to help say happy birthday to my old friend Tom Kibble. Uh, I first met Tom a little over 50 years ago uh, when I visited uh, the theory group here at Imperial College spent the academic year here, 61, 62, the group that was then headed by Abdus Salam. Uh, I already knew Tom Kibble's work. He had written a brilliant paper uh, about the, uh, a new formulation of Einstein's general theory of relativity, uh, which is very suggestive. And I'll come back and mention that paper again. Uh, but that year, I was preoccupied with a different matter, uh, the spontaneous breakdown of symmetry principles. I was running into a problem, and uh, it was a problem that Tom and uh, his colleagues were going to solve two years later, because I didn't know that. And uh, the solution that they found played an essential part in the eventual unification of two of the fundamental forces of nature, the weak and the electromagnetic forces, uh, which became an essential part of what is now called the standard model of elementary particles and forces, including uh, the new particle uh, that you just heard was, uh, was discovered last year at the CERN laboratory. Now, the particle physicists, many of whom I know I see sitting in the front of the auditorium, uh, will understand what I'm talking about. Uh, for others, um, I see people in the back who I don't recognize. I assume they're, they're not physicists, but real people. Uh, uh, I think for them, uh, I'm going to have to say a little bit about what symmetry principles are, and what it means for them to be broken, and what this all has to do with the real world. So uh, with apologies to the physicists who already know this, I will do my best to explain. A symmetry principle is very simply a statement that something looks the same from different points of view. In other words, it's a statement of invariance. The appearance is invariant to your point of view. 
Uh, the simplest example is provided by the human face or a butterfly with its wings extended. Uh, looking in a mirror, which interchanges right and left, uh, you see no difference. Uh, this is not true of everything. It's not true of a glove, for example, but it is true of a butterfly. Uh, that's the simplest of all possible symmetries. Uh, a square, when looked at from above, has a few more, uh, slightly different set of symmetries. Its appearance doesn't change when you rotate your point of view by 90 degrees, or any multiple of 90 degrees in either direction. Uh, a circle it has even more symmetry. Its appearance doesn't change when you view it from above, and you rotate your direction of view by any angle. Uh, that is called a continuous symmetry. It's a symmetry that can be varied continuously. You can rotate by one degree or two degrees or 1.01 degrees. Um, and my talk this evening will only have to do with continuous symmetries. I don't want to have to keep uh, repeating that. Now, these examples are very pretty, and people have always been taken with symmetries like this. But what really interests the physicists, the, especially the elementary particle physicists, are not the symmetries of things, but the symmetries of laws. Uh, not thing, things like butterflies or squares or circles, but the laws of nature. A symmetry principle from this point of view is a statement that the laws of nature don't change when we change our point of view in certain specific ways. Some of these symmetries have to do with changes of our point of view with regard to space and time. For example, Einstein's special theory of relativity is entirely based on a symmetry principle called Lorentz invariance, which states that the laws of nature, in particular, he was concerned with the laws governing electricity and magnetism, but then he extended it to the laws governing everything. The laws of nature don't change their form when we view nature from a moving laboratory. As long as it's moving uniformly, it doesn't matter how fast it's moving, the laws of nature appear the same. Light, for example, always travels at the same speed, no matter how fast you're moving. There are other symmetries uh, that we learned about later that don't have to do with changes in our point of view in space and time. In the 1930s, we learned that there's an approximate symmetry between the two particles that make up the nuclei of atoms, called protons and neutrons. It's not only that in the laws governing nuclear forces, you can change proton, the word proton everywhere into the word neutron and vice versa. You can even change protons and neutrons into particles that are mixtures of protons and neutrons in a continuous way, in a way which is in fact mathematically the same as rotations in ordinary space. And um, this uh, symmetry uh, is, well, why is it important to know that? Well. It wouldn't be important to know that if we knew the laws governing nuclear force. Then the symmetry would be a footnote. We say, look at that. It has the symmetry between protons and neutrons. The, the, the reason why the discovery of this symmetry, and indeed symmetries in general, are important is because we didn't know the laws. But using this symmetry, we could we learned about the symmetry not by looking at the laws that govern nuclear forces, which we didn't know but by doing experiments on the, of the scattering of uh, protons on either protons or neutrons. And uh, in this way, we discovered the symmetry and then could use it to make predictions about other things. For example, one of the predictions is that nuclear states, not only protons and neutrons, but even the states of complicated nuclei, form families, all of which have the same energy and angular momentum. For instance, there's a famous family of boron-12, nitrogen-12, and an excited state of carbon-12. And in this way, we learned a lot about nuclei that was wonderful to learn since we didn't know the fundamental forces. 
And even more important, we had a clue toward an ultimate theory, which we finally did learn, uh, of the nuclear forces uh, that we learned about partly because we had this clue that it had to be a theory that respected this symmetry. Uh, in 1960, uh, so we were excited about symmetries, and more symmetries of this sort were discovered in the late 50s and early 60s. In 1960, uh, some of us became extremely excited by an idea uh, originally from a physicist, Yochiro Nambu at the University of Chicago, which he in turn picked up from the study of superconductivity, the idea was of broken symmetry. That is, a symmetry may be obeyed, perhaps even exactly, by the underlying laws of nature, by the equations that embody the underlying laws, and yet not be obeyed by the solutions of the equations. That is, the actual phenomena observed in the laboratory. In other words, suddenly the, it was open to us to imagine that the laws of nature exhibit, possess at their deepest level, not apparently, but at the level of the fundamental equations, many more symmetries than we knew about. And um, it's a very platonic idea, isn't it, that nature at a deep level is more beautiful and simple than the casual appearance would suggest. Uh, it, we felt like children who discovered a previously hidden cupboard filled by wonderful jars of jam. Uh, but when we opened the door of the cupboard, an alarm sounded. Broken symmetries have consequences, even though they're broken. Of course, that's, that's good. That means that we can learn about them and test them experimentally and so on. But one of the consequences seemed to be violated by common observation. Uh, Jeffrey Goldstone, then I think a research student at the University of Cambridge, found that when an exact symmetry is broken in the sense that I've described, that is, it's an exact symmetry of the equations, it's not a symmetry of the solutions of the equations, there must appear a particle of zero mass and zero spin. Uh, these are called Goldstone particles or Nambu Goldstone particles. Uh, if you want a, an intuitive idea of why this is true, Imagine a very simple symmetry, the symmetry of a circle. Imagine a valley that has perfect circular symmetry. That is, every cross-section around the valley has exactly the same shape as every other cross-section. The valley floor will be level, of course, because if it was higher in one spot or lower in another, then it would not be symmetrical. It wouldn't be the same all the way around the circular valley. Um, that's an example of a symmetry. Drop a ball into the valley. Uh, that breaks the symmetry. It'll come to rest somewhere, not everywhere. Uh, it, wherever it is, that is a symmetry breaking. What are the modes of motion of the, of the ball? Well, because the valley floor is flat, you can give it an infinitesimal shove and it will move any distance around the valley. Being able to create a mode of motion with a negligibly small energy corresponds in elementary particle physics to having particles of zero mass, because you can create them uh, with a negligible amount of energy. There's no minimum energy required to create a single particle of zero mass, like a single photon, the particle of light. Um, and these this mode of motion of rolling around the valley corresponds when you convert this anal by analogy into elementary particle physics, correspond to the Goldstone bosons.
By the way, there was another mode of motion. The ball could roll up and down the valley. Uh, that requires energy, and I'll come back to that. But don't forget it. The, um, now, these Goldstone bosons, uh, Goldstone particles, I'm sorry, I use the word interchangeably. These Goldstone particles uh, predicted by Goldstone uh, as a consequence of broken symmetry, uh, well, it's an interesting prediction. Uh, we're used to predicting particles that hadn't yet been observed. I mean, that's what we do in theoretical physics, is predict things that haven't yet been observed. The trouble is, uh, normally, when you predict a particle that has an unknown mass, the fact that it hasn't yet been observed doesn't bother you too much, because you can always say, you can always weasel out and say, well, it's just too heavy to have been produced by existing accelerators. We need more money to build larger accelerators, and then we'll find the particle. But you can't get out of it that way if you're predicting a particle of zero mass. These particles should have been coming out of the ears of experimental physicists, and they weren't. None of these particles, these Goldstone particles, were known. And then it got worse. While I was here at Imperial College, uh, together with Salam and uh, by long distance with Goldstone, we actually converted what had been essentially anecdotal information provided by Goldstone's original realization into a what looked like a mathematically rigorous theorem that stated whenever you have an exact continuous symmetry which is spontaneously broken, uh, that is, which is broken in the way I've described, there must appear in nature a corresponding massless, spinless particle. A terribly disappointing result, the jam was poisoned. <laughs> then, two years later, Tom Kibble, together with uh, two visitors here to Imperial College, uh, Jerry Goralnik and Carl Hagen, uh, found an exception to the theorem of Goldstone, Salam, and me. By the way, there's a moral here you may notice that it's a good idea to visit Imperial College. <laughs> um, the, the exception is that this theorem, which uh, they were kind enough in their paper to say that we had not made a mathematical mistake, but we had made an assumption uh, which is not necessarily correct. Uh, what they, their exception that uh, Goralnik, Hagen, and Kibble found is that the uh, theorem does not necessarily apply uh, when the symmetry is associated with fields of the sort which is for which the paradigm is the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field is associated with a symmetry which physicists call gauge invariance it's a generalization of the everyday common fact known to all electricians that the absolute value of the voltage doesn't matter. It's only differences of voltages that matter. Uh, there's a generalization of that called gauge invariance, which, among other things, requires the conservation of electric charge. And um, that symmetry, uh, if broken, does not lead to a... Um, to a massless Goldstone boson. The same uh, discovery was made about the same time uh, by well, Broad and Anglia in Brussels and Peter Higgs in Edinburgh. The, um, the, the point that uh, Goralnik, Hagen, and Kibble explained was that Goldstone, Salam, and I had assumed Lorentz invariance. That's the symmetry I mentioned earlier that says that the laws of nature look the same no matter how fast you're moving. Well, in fact, Lorentz invariance does apply to anything that's observable, but we had applied it in the detailed calculations using quantum mechanics which deal with unobservable inter intermediate states, and uh, it simply didn't apply in cases where for example, you have a photon. Um, it took a few years before this discovery of these authors um, turned into 
anything specific about a specific new theory. Essential in that development was a paper written separately by Tom Kibble in 1967. Tom studied a general class of symmetries uh, which generalize the symmetry of gauge invariance, which applies in electrodynamics, to a class of symmetries called local symmetries. Local symmetries are called that because the symmetry operation can vary from place to place in space and time. For example, you might turn protons into neutrons by a certain amount here and a different amount somewhere else. Um, it depends on locality. And uh, what Tom showed is that gold, goldstone particles are absent in all theories in which the broken symmetry is local. Uh, there had been a theory of this sort that was proposed long before all this happened, a theory that was proposed by Chen Ning Yang and Robert Mills, in which they made an attempt to understand the strong nuclear force that holds protons and neutrons together inside the nucleus. It was a theory in which uh, you had a local symmetry, an exact local symmetry, not broken, but it and uh, that theory predicted the existence of particles of zero mass, not goldstone particles, but particles like photons that have the same spin as the photon. And according to the story I heard, Pauli hearing Yang lecture about this walked out of the room in anger because everyone knew that such massless particles, you know, that's the thing, you can't get away with predicting unknown massless particles. They would have already been seen. And Pauli was angry that this suggestion had been made. What, um, what, Kibble, what Kibble's paper showed is that the, as had already been seen in the simpler examples studied by Braudon, Glair, Higgs, Guralnik, Hagen, and Kibble, that um, not only do the Goldstone bosons disappear, but the particles like photons get a mass. And so you wind up with no unwanted massless particles, and you can predict new particles that haven't been seen yet and ask for money and build new accelerators and find them. Um, they're not already ruled out because being massless, they would already have been seen. Um, again, no specific theory at this point was being proposed, although I think the general idea was that this would have something to do with the strong nuclear forces. There was a kind of diversion in which I was involved. Um, as you find even in Nambu's original work in 1960, if you have a broken exact symmetry, you get a Goldstone boson, unless it's a local symmetry. On the other hand, if you have a broken approximate symmetry, you, you get a particle that's approximately massless, in other words, light, relatively light, and a great deal of the work, and this is something I was particularly deeply involved in in the mid-1960s, a great deal of work went into exploring the possibility that the lightest known strongly interacting particle, the pion, was, as Nambu had originally suggested, the Goldstone particle associated, well, the Nambu Goldstone particle associated with a, with a broken symmetry, actually a symmetry related to the symmetry between neutrons and protons, but a little bit more complicated. And in other words, we had found a use for Goldstone particles. Pions were Goldstone particles, just not associated with an exact symmetry. They're merely light, not massless. And because we had a use for Goldstone particles, getting rid of them didn't seem that important, at least at the moment. Um, in 1967, having been working on the theory of pions, um, I decided to try to apply what I had learned uh, to solve an entirely different problem to understand the weak nuclear forces. These are forces 
that don't hold anything together like the strong nuclear forces do, but that allow neutrons and protons inside the nucleus to turn into one another. And in that way, they are responsible for an, a famous kind of radioactivity, which was the first discovered in which a proton or a neutron turns into the other thing, and you get an electron and a neutrino coming out of the nucleus and is also responsible for the first step in the chain of nuclear reactions that gives energy to the sun. We've known about these weak nuclear forces for, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century, but there was no mathematically satisfactory theory of them, and that was the problem that I addressed. Using this brilliant idea of Guralnik, Hagen, Kibble, Braud, Anglaire, and Higgs, that uh, there was a broken symmetry that was responsible not for Goldstone particles but for giving mass to heavy particles that would transmit the forces in the same way that the photon transmits the electromagnetic force. There was already a lot of speculation about a lot, such a particle. In fact, the speculations go back to the 1930s. Um, it was called the W particle. W stood for weak, not Weinberg. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that old, uh, <laughs> despite appearances. Uh, and uh, people have been speculating about a heavy particle with the same spin as the photon, but that would transmit the weak nuclear force the same way that photons transmit the electromagnetic force. It was an old idea, so maybe the W particle got its mass as explained by Higgs and Kibble and all the other people, and uh, it worked. This produced a theory of weak interactions, which uh, turned out inevitably to be also a theory of electromagnetic interactions. In other words, it was a unified theory, which we now call the electroweak theory. The same theory was developed independently by Abdus Salam, not surprisingly, because we had both been thinking about broken symmetries for some time. Uh, and uh, it, this is a theory that, was, that predicted a new kind of weak nuclear force, the so-called neutral current force, which is associated with another heavier particle uh, like the W particle, but I called it the Z particle because it's the last letter in the alphabet, and I was hoping that was the end of it. <laughs> and um, and that the W and the Z particle were, well, the weak neutral currents were discovered at CERN in the 1970s. The W and the Z were discovered at CERN in the 1980s. And this theory is now generally accepted uh, as the correct theory of the um, weak and electromagnetic forces. By the way, uh, although there are no Goldstone particles in this theory, it's not impossible that there really are Goldstone particles, even of exact symmetries in nature. They wouldn't be particles that are part of the standard model, but they may, for example, represent, come from symmetries of the dark matter. In particular, experiments on the microwave background have persistently shown that the number of massless particles like neutrinos, the number of species uh, that were present in the early universe is not three, which is what you would expect because we know three types of neutrino in today's physics, but something like three and a half. Um, and uh, in fact, a massless Goldstone boson would look for, for these purposes like four-sevenths of a neutrino. So it may be uh, that there is some symmetry of the dark matter which is spontaneously broken, produce, is not a local symmetry, and therefore actually does produce a Goldstone particle, a massless particle, and that this is what the, ex the observers are seeing. It's probably just a wild speculation. If it turns out to be true, remember you heard it here first. Uh, now, I want to come to the particle that was discovered 
last year at CERN. Uh, broken symmetries don't get broken by themselves. Uh, there must be some kind of force or some kind of field that produces the symmetry breaking. For example, take a piece of iron. If, the, if it's very hot, above 770 degrees centigrade, uh, it will have complete symmetry between different directions. The laws governing the forces between the iron atoms do not care about whether you're looking north or east or up or down. They're the same in all directions. But let the iron cool below 770 degrees, and a magnetic field will turn on spontaneously, breaking the symmetry. The mag a magnetic field points in one direction, and all the iron atoms will line up so that they're spinning around that direction. This uh, is a classic example, which predates the use of broken symmetry in particle physics, of a spontaneously broken symmetry. In the same way, uh, something has to be added to just the theory of quarks and electrons and neutrinos and W particles and Z particles and photons to make the symmetry broken. Uh, this, from the beginning, from Goldstone's 1960 paper, uh, what was added typically were fields like the magnetic field, which would point in a particular direction and break the symmetry, but not break the symmetry with regard to directions in space. But so, so these fields have no sense of spatial direction, but they break the symmetry between different directions that distinguish an electron from a neutrino or a W particle from a photon. Uh, and these fields turned on just as the magnetic field in a bar of iron turns on when the temperature drops below 770 degrees centigrade, these fields turned on in the early universe as the temperature of the universe cooled below, I have to convert from energy into, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, it was 10 to the 13 degrees, whatever, uh, some very high temperature. And, uh, in the present universe, these fields uh, have a direction which distinguishes the weak interactions from the electromagnetic interactions, distinguishes electrons from neutrinos. In the, uh, as I said, such fields were introduced in the illustrative examples used by Goldstone, and then in the illustrative examples used in 1964 by Goralnik, Hagen, and Kibble, and Browden, Anglair, and Higgs and then in 1967 by Kibble. This is the way people broke symmetries. In 1967-8, when Salam and I developed the electroweak theory, we found that the simplest, the most natural thing to do was to introduce four of these fields. Um, for the physicists, I'll say one complex doublet, but that amounts to four independent real fields. Three of them get used up giving mass to the W, which comes in positive and negative charges, and the Z. And the fourth one is an actual physical particle, which is predicted by the theory. If you remember my example of the circular valley, uh, rolling around the flat floor of the valley is the Goldstone mode, which is eliminated by this uh, mechanism it, that's the one that gives mass to the, vec to the particles like photons, to the force-carrying particles. But then there is the other mode where it does require some energy to produce it, where you roll up and down the sides of the valley. That's like this additional particle which is left over and is an actual physical particle with a definite mass because it takes some energy to produce it. That's the characteristic of a particle with mass. It takes energy, E equals mc square, to produce the damn thing. The, um, these particles could have been called Goldstone particles, but that name had already been taken by the ones we didn't want, the massless ones that corresponded to rolling around the valley floor. Um, the name that has 
developed for them are Higgs particles, although they could just as well have been called Braut, Anglaire, Goralnik, Hagen, Kibble, uh, Higgs particles, or they, they could just as well, for, from my point of view, they could just as well have been called Kibble particles. But, but the name has stuck. Uh, Higgs has only one syllable. Uh, and um, so we, we all call them Higgs particles these days. Uh, the, uh, this particle has definite properties. It has no spin, and that follows from the fact that these fields can't distinguish directions in space. They only distinguish directions in an internal space which distinguishes different types of particle. So like a knuckleball in baseball, if you know what that is, uh, these fields have no spin. Uh, they have a variety of properties of the way they interact, all of which are uniquely predicted by the electroweak theory. The only thing that was not predicted by the electroweak theory is the particle's mass, I guess, and its name. <laughs> and um, not knowing the mass, uh, uh, well, we knew the mass had to be less than about a thousand times the proton mass because the theory wouldn't have made any sense if it was heavier than that. Uh, but, so it could be found if we build an accelerator with enough energy. There was indirect evidence that it was considerably lighter than that, probably uh, lighter than a few hundred times the proton mass. Um, both the aborted superconducting supercollider accelerator in Texas, uh, which was canceled in 1993, and the successful Large Hadron Collider in CERN, uh, they were not built just with the idea that all they would do is to produce this particle, but this was the one thing that we knew they could produce, and if they didn't find it, that would be even more interesting, because then we would know that we had to look elsewhere for the source of symmetry breaking. Uh, the particle was found, the announcement was made last July, and uh, so far, uh, all of its properties agree with the properties predicted by the standard model. It looks just like we expect. The spin, the fact that it has no spin has not yet been confirmed. Uh, but within, in some cases, what are large error margins, uh, it looks like the particle predicted in the electroweak theory, uh, which is nice, but in a way dis disappointing. It would have been more exciting if it uh, appeared as something entirely new and strange. Um, I hope that the Large Hadron Collider is not doomed uh, to simply verify the standard model over and over again. Uh, we all hope it will discover something quite new, like the particles that make up the dark matter that makes up five-sixths of the mass of the universe, uh, we don't know. Uh, so far, the Large Hadron Collider has done a wonderful job of confirming the standard model, most dramatically in the discovery of this new particle. Well, let me now, before closing, come back to Tom Kibble. Uh, I've been talking about broken local symmetries because that's what I know best. And by the way, uh, the work that I knew of that Tom had done before I even came here in 1961 had to do with a local symmetry. He had made Lorentz invariance, the symmetry between um, different uh, speeds of observers and also different locations of observers. Actually, the physicists call it Poincaré invariance. He had made that into a local symmetry, which then turned out to look like general relativity. It was a different explanation of general relativity. That was not a broken symmetry. Um, but he's done a lot of other things. And uh, this morning, Neil Turok uh, talked about Tom's work on the theory of uh, discontinuities in space, defects. Uh, which turns out actually to be, as Tom brilliantly explained, a, 
an example of how by knowing that a theory has a certain symmetry and knowing the smaller symmetry into which it is broken, knowing the two together, you can figure out the kind of discontinuities like monopoles or vortex lines or sheets, boundaries, flat boundaries. You can learn the kinds of discontinuities that are stable by just knowing the symmetry group and what symmetry group remains after symmetry breaking. Uh, he initiated this study, which is now pursued in laboratory experiments and is a constant preoccupation of astronomers who study uh, the early universe. Uh, Tom is a wonderful theoretical physicist. I have happy memories of my year at Imperial College. I got to know London a little. I got to know Abdus Salam a little. Uh, but not the least of my happy memories of that year is that I became friends with Tom Kibble. Thank you. There will be time for questions and answers, but before we go to that, I'd like to now also pay my respects uh, more briefly to my host at Imperial College years ago, Abdus Salam, and mention uh, one incident in which I was kept from making these remarks earlier. Abdus Salam was a devo devout Muslim but without hostility to those who didn't share his faith. He was a man of peace, but he was not weak in the face of oppression in his home country. He was a marvelous theoretical physicist, and he sacrificed much of what for a theoretical physicist is one's most precious asset, time. He, he sacrificed much of his time that he needed for his own work uh, to bring science to the developing world. And I miss him very much. Mike Duff here will remember that I was invited to give a talk in Salam's honor in July 2007. I was very glad to have a chance to speak in praise of Salam and I would have said what I just said, but at much greater length. So I accepted. But then I had to withdraw, and I'd like to explain why. It had nothing whatever to do with Salam. Uh, I, a few months before I was supposed to come here to talk, I learned that the National Union of Journalists had voted to boycott Israeli products and that other similar initiatives were under consideration by the uh, University and College Union and the universities of Brighton and of East London. Uh, and there had been a previous uh, example of this kind of voting of boycotts by the National Association of Teachers in Further and Higher Education. Uh, over the years, I had seen various signs of hostility in Britain, especially in the worlds of journalism and academic, academia, where I would naturally expect to find allies. Uh, I had seen signs of a hostility to Israel, a country uh, surrounded by enemies that have been trying to destroy it since its foundation in 1948, a country that's taken in hundreds of thousands of refugees from oppression uh, in those countries, and whose efforts at self-defense are regularly condemned as a violation of human rights. And uh, these boycott motions seem only to be directed at Israel, 
although the world is filled with countries that are really oppressive and really aggressive, which don't seem to evoke this kind of reaction. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I uh, can only express, try to explain why back in 19, in, back in 2007, I felt I had to withdraw from an engagement to speak here. I, I could only understand this hostility as a sign of either a really spectacular moral blindness or of anti-Semitism, or both. Uh, and uh, I found that although I had no intention of starting a boycott of my own, or indeed of making a big fuss, I just felt I had to act out a uh, personal gesture of protest, and so I uh, couldn't, so I declined to come to Britain, even though I very much wanted to come to praise Salaam. Things seem to be getting better. Uh, two weeks ago, the Oxford Union, uh, the Oxford University Students Union, uh, voted not to join a boycott and uh, uh, a boycott movement, uh, which had been proposed. And uh, perhaps this means that uh, this this will all be better. I don't know. As I said, I'm not an expert on this issue. Things may be just as bad in other parts of Europe. I know the situation in England better because I speak English and because I care about England more than I care about other European countries. Uh, I'm here now uh, because I wanted to praise, above all because I wanted to praise Tom Kibble. It also gave me an opportunity to praise Abdus Salam as I had wanted to earlier, and because I think that people of goodwill should speak out about this. And now I have. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Stephen, for a, a really brilliant uh, exposition of a very fascinating and rich period of history in theoretical physics and a beautiful uh, profile of Tom's specific contributions. And I think the audience here today of, of full capacity, and if we had the fire wardens here, would be in trouble, is testament to the fact that we are very honored and grateful that you've come this time to join us in celebrating Tom's birthday. So thank you again. Stephen's kindly agreed to take some questions, and so I'd like to invite people uh, some questions both from the front of the audience and also from the back. And I understand there's some microphones uh, which will be passed around for the questions. So please, some questions. Yes. Uh, good. Good evening. Good evening. Um, and what do you mean exactly uh, that by saying that uh, a goldstone particle may be four sevenths of a neutrino? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, well, I mean that um, since a, 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 a goldstone particle has no spin, whereas neutrinos have um, two, well, they have spin a half, which means they can spin this way or this way. There are two ways that they can spin. Um, in, in, uh, under the conditions of thermodynamics, you would have two neutrinos for every Goldstone particle. Uh, so that would suggest that the ratio in, would be a half. Uh, but it's not a half because in addition to having spin, neutrinos are a kind of particle called fermions, which means they don't like to get into the same state. And um, calculations are well known in astrophysics. You can read about it in the book that you kindly mentioned the first three minutes, uh, that because of that, fermions only contribute seven-eighths as much. Each fermion state only contributes seven-eighths as much energy as a 
state of a particle like the Goldstone boson. So I took one half of se um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I meant to say seven sixteenths. <laughs> I took one, one half of seven eighths. No, I'm sorry. No, I did the right thing. So the bosons are eight sevenths of what the fermions are, and you take one half of eight sevenths, you get four sevenths. That's why. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the mind is the first to go. <laughs> uh, by the. <laughs> By the way, uh, there was one thing about uh, Tom's uh, 1967 paper that I had meant to say, and it's in my notes, but I had neglected to mention. Uh, Tom made a very important observation in that paper that you could have a, uh, this is also relevant to his work on defects, you could have a symmetry which is only partly broken, a local symmetry which is only partly broken, and then the force-carrying particles like photons that are not associated with broken symmetries remain massless. And in working out the electroweak theory, um, I don't remember, I don't know how Salam uh, thought about this, but at a certain point I discovered there was a massless particle in the theory, and I said, oh yes, this is what Kibble said. And I referred to it in the paper in that way, uh, that Kibble had said that any particle that was associated with an unbroken symmetry, any of these force-carrying particles, would remain massless. This, in fact, was the photon. And this was the realization that what the theory was not just a theory of weak interactions. It was a theory of weak and electromagnetic interactions. Um, I recognized the photon appearing in the theory because I knew Kibble's paper, which had anticipated that some of the force-carrying particles would remain massless. So I wanted to get that in. Uh, Another question. Happy to take questions about any part of my talk, including the last part. I, I have a question over here. Uh, I'm, uh, it, sorry, I should stand up. Over here. It's in relation to uh, your remark about uh, Tom Kibble's paper on general relativity and then all your discussion of uh, quantum theory in relation to particle physics. What, what hope do you have of uh, a um, unification between quantum theory and general relativity? Ah, well, in a sense, we already have a perfectly good quantum theory of gravity. It's uh, what's called an effective field theory in which uh, you allow into the equations of the theory, every conceivable uh, kind of interaction that is allowed by the underlying symmetry principle, which is Einstein's symmetry called general covariance, which says you can use any coordinate system you like. Uh, if you write down the most, of course, such a theory will have an infinite number of, of terms in the equations. The equations will be infinitely long. Um, at low energy, meaning the energies we can explore with human resources in laboratories like CERN, uh, only a few of these terms will be significant. And, um, but in such an effective field theory, there will be a cancellation for every possible infinity. Uh, for every infinity, you can simply absorb the infinity into a redefinition or a renormalization of one of these infinite number of terms in the equations. This is a perfectly good quantum theory of gravity, which we already have. Uh, it's very much like the quantum theory of low energy pi mesons, which I mentioned in the course of my talk, which is also a theory with an infinite number of terms, but where only a few terms enter at sufficiently low energy, so you can actually use the theory. Uh, the trouble is, just as the theory of low energy pi mesons loses all predictive power when you try to use it at energies approaching the mass of a proton, the theory, the, the effective field theory of gravity loses all predictive power when you try to use it at very high energy scales. And what I mean by very high energy scales is something like 10,000 trillion times the mass of a proton. I may have lost a few zeros there. Uh, but in, uh, very, very high energies, much higher than can be reached in any conceivable accelerator laboratory. This, but 
undoubtedly energies that were present in the very early universe. So although we have a perfectly good quantum theory of gravity, it, it loses all, pr it's, it's not the final theory. Uh, just like the th in the theory of low energy pi mesons, there is an underlying theory, which we now know, although we didn't know it in the mid-1960s, it's a theory called quantum chromodynamics, in which there are only a few terms in the equations, and we know how to do calculations at, under, at high energy. Uh, we don't have the analog of that for gravity. Uh, string theorists, and there are some in the room, uh, think that string theory may be that theory uh, that provides a, quant a completion of the effective field theory of gravity. Who knows? It, it, so far it hasn't led to any predictions that can be verified, but one shouldn't be impatient. I mean, look how long it was for the prediction of atoms by Democritus to be verified. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we... <laughs> We have to have patience, and uh, by and by we'll know. Uh, I have great hope for the future, although not necessarily for my future. But uh, yes, is there another question? It's down. I can't see. Yeah, it's just down in the front. Down. Your eyes are better than mine. I can't see them. It's just down now. Okay. Hi. Uh, th thanks for your talk. I'd like to respond to the last part. Uh, first of all, you uh, made the claim that uh, Israel has been under attack since it came into existence in 1948. I don't think that's uh, an accurate appraisal of the situation. Um, there are five million Palestinian refugees registered to the UN, and for the last 46 years, uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip have been under military occupation. Um, I've been there and the situation is very horrible. Uh, you, you made the claim that Israel is being singled out and compared with a, a lot of the other horrible countries. I agree with you that uh, there are a lot of nasty countries in the world, but consider, for example, North Korea, uh, Iran, they uh, have sanctions on them, whereas Israel, on the other hand, uh, receives more aid from the United States than all of Africa put, put together. It has preferential trade agreements with the EU. And since it's an ally uh, of the Western countries, I think it should be held to higher standards. The, uh, in, in November, the chair of the African National Congress described the situation as uh, worse than what she suffered under apartheid in South Africa. When the South Africans called for the international community to, uh, to join the boycott in support of their human rights, we did. And, uh, and the situation improved in South Africa. Now the Palestinians uh, in 2005 called for the international community to support them. And I think that we should uh, respond to that call and I think we should support the call. Well, you raise a number of points and I'm sure there are many people who agree with you, but I don't. I mean, with regard to the statement that Israel has been under attack, it's certainly the United Nations uh, established a, a two-state solution. Uh, Israel was going to be a fraction of what had been uh, under the Ottoman Empire called um, West Palestine, uh, that is the part of Palestine west of the Jordan River. Uh, and it, the Israelis accepted that, that fraction. Um, the Arabs did not accept it and in fact attacked Israel um, as a result of the peace, Israel expanded uh, from what was originally intended by the UN. There did not come into existence an, uh, an Arab state uh, because the Arabs would not allow it. The, the Jordanians con continued to control the West Bank and the Egyptians continued to control Gaza. The reason that there were um, refugees from what became Israel is because the Arab states would not allow those Arabs to settle in Jordan or Syria or Egypt or Arabia. They kept them as a continual uh, challenge in 
the West Bank and in Gaza. They penned them in there. The um, Israelis, on the other hand, welcomed refugees from all over the Arab world, a number which is about equal, it's something of the order of five or 600,000 Jews fled Arab countries, just as five or 600,000 Arabs uh, fled Israel. I'm not even sure that that's, that's a correct number. Um, the, uh, the hostility continued. There was endless cross-border raids. The Palestine Liberation Organization was founded in 1964 not to liberate the West Bank and Gaza, which at that time were in Arab hands, but liberation in the, word, in the PLO stood for the annihilation of the state of Israel. And countries like Saudi Arabia, Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq, never made peace with Israel. I Egypt and Jordan are exceptional in that respect. And furthermore, Iran threatens to annihilate Israel, not because, and, and Hamas is the same. It is not because Israel controls the West Bank, or it is because Israel exists. Hamas has made it clear, and Iran has, the leaders of Iran have made it clear that they're not interested in a two-state solution. They're interested in the wiping out the state of Israel. Uh, the reason that there are sanctions against North Korea and Iran is because those are countries that actively threaten other neighboring countries. North Korea has threatened South Korea. It has recently threatened the United States. Um, Iran, the president of, of Iran, Ahmadinejad, has said that Israel should be wiped out. It is, that's the difference. That's why these countries are under sanctions. What does Israel want to do? Does Israel want to wipe out Iran? Does it want to wipe out any of its neighbors? Not at all. What Israel wants is simply to be left alone to develop in peace. It has an Arab population uh, which is, which are, who are citizens and are treated like every other citizen of Israel, with the one exception that they're not required to serve in the army. I think that may be changing. I'm not sure. Uh, they, are, they have access to the same universities, to the same schools. Uh, Israel is a wonderful example of a multinational country which really works. Then there is the West Bank, which is not part of Israel and which cannot be absorbed by Israel and which threatens Israel. And so, just as the British were forced to build a peace wall in Northern Ireland to separate Catholic and Protestant communities, not for reasons of apartheid because they don't want to associate with each other, but for, to avoid violence in the same way the Israelis have had to control their borders and build a wall. It's not because they don't want to associate with Arabs, but because they don't want to be murdered by them. In fact, the building of the wall has reduced the number of terrorist attacks in Israel. And it's hard to put myself in the frame of mind to someone who, who would want to go back to the situation previous and increase the number of murders in order to avoid the real inconvenience that is created by that wall for both Israelis and Arabs. Um, I see no, um, look, no country is perfect. One cannot defend any, everything that any country does, but at the bottom, what Israel does is aimed at surviving and being peaceful, and it would even be nice to have good relations with its neighbors and have the kind of trade and tourism and so on that it had wanted so much when it signed the peace treaty with Egypt. At any rate, it wants to be left in peace, and uh, that to me is the fundamental difference which motivated my feelings which I described this evening.
I'm uh, very aware of the time, and we have uh, one more important uh, piece of the formalities this evening. And it's, uh, to, I would like to invite uh, Michael Duff, who holds the uh, Abdus Salam Chair of uh, Theoretical Physics at Imperial, to provide a vote of thanks uh, to uh, the fantastic talk that Stephen gave about Tom Kibble. Michael. Well, first of all, thank you, Steve, for a masterly exposition of Tom Kibble's achievements in theoretical physics. Steven Weinberg is one of my scientific heroes, as indeed was Abdus Salam. So it's a particular privilege for me to be able to give this vote of thanks this evening. He's, of course, well known to everybody as one of the world's leading physicists, but I'd like to spend a few moments reminiscing about Steven Weinberg, the man as I know him. My first interaction came as a young postdoc at King's College in 1976. I picked up the phone in my office and I heard those five words most designed to instill fear and trembling into the heart of a young postdoc. Hi, this is Steven Weinberg. <laughs> Steve had been reading one of my papers and had uh, wanted to know rather urgently whether I'd made a sign error. <laughs> so I spent the weekend sweating over it. Anyone who's ever chased a minus sign will know my discomfort, especially when Steve Weinberg, who for all his qualities is not famous for tolerating fools gladly, <laughs> is waiting at the other end. Anyway, I stuck to my guns and said that the sign was right, and Steve graciously wrote me a letter, and maybe we can see that letter. November 1976. By the way, for the younger members of the audience, this is called a letter. <laughs> It's written with pen and ink in longhand. Uh, Steve graciously wrote to say that he'd repeated the calculation himself over the weekend and agreed with me. Anyway. I'm glad you explained that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we kept in touch with our common interest, which was the quantum theory of gravity. And in 1982, I spent a, a wonderful uh, semester at the University of Texas in Austin as the guest of Steve and his colleague John Wheeler. <clears throat> it was a stimulating atmosphere there and it turned out to be one of the most productive periods of my career working with Chris Pope and Bank Nielsen on the 11 dimensional approach to a unified theory. <clears throat> the experience was made even more pleasant however by the gracious hospitality of Steve and his wife Louise, who's sitting here tonight, uh, at their house in Austin. Now, towering intellect though Steve may be, he's not your archetypal absent-minded professor. As the son of a New York taxi driver, he's always been very street smart, an ability that he brings to bear whether he's testifying to congressional committees or dealing with the media or answering questions at physics seminars. You won't fa find Stephen Weinberg wearing odd socks. I recall an incident at the Shelter Island Conference in 1983, by the way, I checked the date. Uh -huh. The first Shelter Island Conference in 1949 was famous for the foundations of quantum electrodynamics when Beta, Feynman, Tom and Arga, Schwinger and others laid down the foundations of that theory. And 35 years later, the leading lights reassembled in Shelter Island to commemorate the anniversary. And I don't know if Steve remembers this, but when it was his turn to stand up to speak, the light went out on his view graph. You don't remember that? No, I don't no. remember that, no. <laughs> and uh, Hans Bater, who was sitting in the front row, got up to help. 
And then T.D. Lee said, no, you should do it this way. And then Dick Feynman, Linus Powling, and pretty soon each of them convinced that they knew better than the other how to <laughs> help. And pretty soon all the leading lights of 20th century physics were posing the question, how many Nobel Prize winners does it take to change a light? <laughs> now, someone in the audience spotted this as a golden photo opportunity and raised a camera. And Steve, I noticed, saw from the corner of his eye and nimbly stepped aside, <laughs> thus saving his dignity when all around him were losing theirs. <laughs> Well, Steve may have lost his physical mobility, but I think we heard from tonight's talk that his mind is still as nimble as ever. Today was always going to be a special day, but Steve, for you to travel from Austin to tell us all about your reminiscences with Tom has been icing on the cake, and we thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I, uh, I mentioned scientific heroes, but there's another member of that pantheon, Tom Kibble. I first met Tom in 1969, and although I had a period in the United States, we've been colleagues on and off ever since. And on behalf of the past and present members of the theoretical physics group, Tom, I'd like to thank you for all that you did for the group your scientific and personal leadership, all done, I might say, with a modesty and humility that sometimes takes your breath away. You have set the standard to which the rest of us aspire, and we salute you. Thank you. <laughs>